Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. We created this podcast to share the wonderful people we get to interact with, we get to meet, we get to know, and most importantly, get to learn from. So I invite you to join us on this journey here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Rob yeah. Newsom, wonderful to uh, have met you. I, we haven't done that in person yet, but I hope we get to remedy that soon. I'd love to chat with you today about you, where you come from, who you are, your amazing career in the uh, in the military, uh, some of the interesting things you've done since, and uh, your and what are you thinking about for the future? There's just so much, but let's just start at the beginning. Uh, where'd you grow up, Rob? Yeah, well, my dad was in the Navy, so I spent uh, my very young youth in Hawaii and El Centro, California. He retired in 1975, moved back to his home state, my mom's home state of Kansas. And so I grew up in, in Kansas, a very small town northwest of Kansas City called Wellsville, Kansas. Great, great place all, to all grow up. landlocked guys growing up but going to the Navy. <laughs> huh? That's right. You, that you, need, uh, you need hard Midwesterners that can, can tough it out. Is that a common thing uh, for Midwesterners to go into the Navy? No, it, it's not. I, you know, I've, I've got two or three... Uh, two or three friends from the Midwest who, who became Navy SEALs, but I, I don't, I don't think it's very common at all. So uh, w you grew up in this, sounds like a pretty, uh, pretty idyllic situation growing up. Yeah. My dad was a, a school teacher. My mom was a uh, first in nursing home administrator. And then later in life, got her nursing degree and became a nurse. I grew up in Wellsville, graduated, got a national ROTC scholarship and went to the university of Kansas walked on the football team and, and played. Uh, I redshirted one year, so I ended up playing five seasons with the Jayhawks, then went into the Navy straight into uh, Navy SEAL training. A 30-year career altogether in the service? Yeah, just just short. It was uh, 29 years and 10 months when I was uh, retiring. A friend asked me to jump out early. He was the, the director of the White House military office as a, as a one-star admiral, he needed a deputy. So he asked me to retire a few months early and get a, take a civilian appointment as a senior executive service. That must've been another great adventure and one that probably helped you in terms of uh, uh, adjusting from a, let's round up a 30 year military career. That was probably a, a, a nice, nice second act that helped you to adjust to a different kind of world, I would think. Yeah, it was a great halfway house for a military guy, right? Because I was a civilian within the Department of Defense in embedded in in the White House and the East, East Wing. It was a it was a good good transition and while still being close to the military and, and what an experience working with with the the military's best, Air Force One, Marine One, Camp David, the White House Medical Office and the White House Mass. It was just just an amazing experience. So tell us, uh, let's start there in the middle. Let's call that your middle view. <laughs> tell us about what your responsibilities were there. You just indicated some of them. Fill it in yes. a little bit. So I was a deputy director of, uh, of what they call WAMA, White House Military Office. So I supported the director, and really my focus was, was down and in. He really wanted to um, strengthen the culture. So we had a very large culture effort where – we focused on our values and and integrating strong leadership. I'm a I'm a huge believer of the Arbinger Institute and their philosophy of outward mindset. We brought Arbinger in to teach a two day workshop with all our senior leaders, and really the outward mindset is about seeing other people as people and treating them as you would want to be treated. Instead of the alternate perspective is to have an inward mindset where you see people as objects, as things. Either they're tools that you use to get what you want, they're obstacles in your way, or they're neither, and so they just don't matter. So it was a really great great way to get the team focused on you know, serving each other as teammates. And you had several different branches of the uh, service that you were working with there. So you had to orchestrate and coordinate a lot of different activities, I would assume, different kinds of cultures too. Yeah, with, without a doubt, there was it was every service. So, including including a Coast Guard was assigned to us. So, five services. There were different units that were very solely serviced from the service. Uh, for example, the, the Marine Corps Air, 
Marine One helicopter unit that flies the president is an all Marine unit. Air Force One is an all Air Force unit. We had an Army transportation unit that, that drove vehicles around for us. And then we had a joint, several joint elements that did uh, communications or, or medical support. Uh, back in the uh, 90s, uh, Rob, I had occasion to travel with then President Clinton on his first trip as president to Ireland. And it, it was a pinch me uh, experience, pinch me week for this kid from uh, South Queens. But uh, one of the things I remember about it is being awe, uh, in awe of the logistics that goes into moving a president internationally. Uh, the, uh, the amount of people on the ground, uh, the logistics of uh, communications and support and evacuation planning. I was just I was just knocked out by the behind the curtains things I got to see from my perspective there about what a big effort that is. It, it's absolutely enormous. You know, I had a sense of that when I was a young lieutenant in, in, uh, in the Pacific probably on that that trip that you made with, with President Clinton and several others, military movement almost stops because it, it sucks up so many air transports. And so we were we were stuck on an exercise in Indonesia for a couple extra weeks waiting for the that air transport to free up and take us back to back to no Guam. No kidding. I would oh, never yeah. have guessed that. I had an opportunity one time, uh, as I mentioned to you when we chatted another time, uh, of making a, a JCOC trip with the uh, Secretary of Defense. And I was just blown away by our military's reach around the globe. Yes. And yes. the amount of uh, stuff we have. But to then to think that moving a president would suck so much of that stuff <laughs> that you'd be uh, invited to stay an extra couple of weeks on an exercise. That's right. <laughs> No, it's it, it, and as you pointed out, the planning and logistics and coordination is just so extensive and broad that uh, it's it's eye watering to see it executed with such precision. So, how long did you work in the White House, Ron? Yeah, I was there. I was there for eleven months. The tour of the the current director, and then I was I was temporary director. And then I took a leave of absence to finish my PhD in leadership studies out of the University of San Diego. I had, I had the USD was fantastic as a military member. I spent uh, almost two years in Yemen deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. So they gave me a lot of leash to finish my my PhD. But at some point, we both had the sense that either you finish or you don't. And so I took a leave of absence and, and really focused on finishing my my dissertation. With the plan to, to go back and uh, take another political appointment, potentially in the Pentagon, but I reached out to a great foundation called the the, the Honor Foundation, and, and they do transition support and education for special operations members. And so I was involved with them for, for probably 15 years before I got out, and then I just reached out and I said, look, I'm I'm interested in what kind of crazy non-military, non-contracting, you know, far afield jobs you have. And they connected me with the Philadelphia 76ers, which this um, is amazing. So you know, far afield. <laughs> how how varied I can't imagine when we get into it, how varied your experiences were in your 29 year and 10 month uh, uh, active duty service. But then to have that ex exposure in a White House. Oh, by the way, you're working on your PhD at the same time. Boom, back, leave of absence. Get your PhD in? In leadership studies mm -hmm. from the School of, of Leadership and Executive Science, Souls at the uh, at University of San Diego. On his foundation, get uh, get an introduction to the Philadelphia 76s, uh, which, of course, was immediately in your sight path is the next things you might do, I'm sure. <laughs> So far afield, and that's that's what attracted me. You know, I I asked for something that was very unique, and the Honor Foundation said, "Well, we've got this this guy. He's a vice president of basketball operations at at the Seventy Sixers. He keeps calling us all the time, wanting to interview a seal. And it turns out Alex Rucker, who's a, who's a great guy, was their VP of basketball ops and and executive vice president. 
And he knew someone who went through the Honor Foundation, understood what unique talents special operators bring to an organization, and just wanted to interview someone for the, their current opening, which was vice president of athlete care. And I, they told me that. And I said, look, I don't know anything about basketball. The, I don't follow professional sports. I have no idea what athlete care is. But this is strange enough that I'd like to talk to them. And I hit it off with Alex, who is a former Navy pilot. I interviewed with Elton Brand, the tremendous general manager and, and former NBA player. So we kind of co-created a job, which included for the first season, vice president of athlete care, which, which includes the medical department and the sports science performance department. They brought me in because they, they wanted a little bit of, of leadership, mentoring, and guidance with their two really deep subject matter experts that were new leaders. And so that was part of the job. They knew I came from a strategy background, a heavy, heavy emphasis on, on culture. So part of my, my portfolio was, was helping to develop the culture of the staff. When, when you think about NBA teams, there's a lot of emphasis and focus on the culture of the team, right? The head coach leads that, and it's, it's the 17 guys and the coaching staff that are around the team that really develop that culture. And the rest of the staff is kind of a forgotten appendage. So we tried to focus on developing the, the culture within the basketball operations staff. The other part of the portfolio was, was just leadership and decision-making support. So I helped the senior leaders, Elton Brand, kind of look around corners and think about the problems they were facing to, to shape better decisions. Did you notice much of a difference around other NBA teams and their culture and their leadership style? And what impact did it have in terms of their performance if you did? There's a great, um, I guess, debate or philosophical discussion in professional sports and especially in basketball that relates to two potential pursuits. One is talent. Talent is king. Right. You build the very best team, the most talented team you can. And the other one is around culture fit and the identity of the team. And so when they brought me in, they, they had these discussions and they said, look, we and, and these guys had been around and in the NBA for decades. And they said there's there's two ways to do this. And certainly there have been teams who have won championships and maybe even multiple championships who might not have had a great culture that didn't have a great fit, whose stars battled each other instead of, instead of worked with each other, but they still succeeded. And so the question was for, in their minds, how far can we take it with, with the different kind of approach on culture and teamwork? My biggest lesson was around the topic of fit, right? And, and so at the time, we had two all-stars who were absolutely phenomenal in their, their own right, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, both incredibly talented, but their playing styles really didn't mesh. And, and a ton of talking heads and reporters and fans always commented about how they don't, they don't fit well together in just playing styles. But I also think personalities and, and the way they responded to each other and to coaching was just very different. Fit seemed to me to be something so important and, and I could see it in, in the staff as well. And, and, you know, whether you fit into the leader's philosophy or whether he valued something that you brought or, or not. So my big takeaway was, was fit is absolutely critical and is not synonymous with talent or ability to contribute, right? You can be the best in your class and still not fit with a team and, and someone would get traded and then they would flourish. It's a matter of them finding their place and finding a fit that that works for them. So it's not works for their style. Yeah, exactly. Or and or their personality, right? So I, I kind of took that at, on a personal basis to be like, look, at each one of us have have an ideal fit somewhere 
try as you might, it you might not be able to make the fit work where you are. So it's okay to continue to search to find that fit. Now, how important is it uh, uh, in your training, your experience, to be able to recognize the type of culture, the type of environment you're in, and adjust your own style to it? So not look for the best fit for your style, but to adjust your style to bet best fit the circumstance from from a military perspective a military person transfers every two or three years to a new job and yep. each organization has a different culture and then special operations guys are are going both into different organizational cultures i had the great opportunity to lead a joint interagency task force for admiral mcraven in afghanistan you know, it had every government agency you could think of, CIA, Department of State, Customs, and each one of those people brought their own organizational culture. And then, of course, you tried to build an organization that that took the best of, of all of that. And, of course, we were embedded in, in foreign cultures and had foreign partners. And so we became very adept at rapid assimilation. And I was just watching... Tony Parker's video, right? Tony Parker's the, the the great French basketball player. And he talked about how the greats adjust their play and their style to the yes. rest of the team. And, and that's what made a difference for him and, and, and the French national team is when it wasn't about how he played, it was about how he helped others play better. And, and mm -hmm. so I think that adjustment of leaders, of coaches, right? You might have a single coaching style, but not everybody responds to that. So you need to adjust to, to those around you if it's not just about you, right? If it's not one way or the highway, and if you want to maximize contribution and, and help people fit, then you have to adjust to them. Well, you, you, we're talking about leadership, and you just breezed by a name of someone who, when you look up, leadership in the dictionary, their name is there. Admiral McRaven, working for him, what, what was that like? What did you learn? How has it impacted your personal style today? Yeah, well, I, I tell you, I, you know, my career was so blessed. I, I worked directly with Admiral McRaven, with General McChrystal, under, uh, closely under General Petraeus and General Mattis. So I, I really saw the pantheon. Four, four giants. Yes, amazing military leadership. You, I guess I got to see them in action more, General McChrystal and Admiral McRaven. And one of the things that I loved about them, which I, I try to adopt, is their ability to, to think out loud and to explain their thinking. I was in a conversation with General McChrystal about leading networks, right? That the, mm -hmm. the National Mission Force was really a networked organization, team of teams and, and all of that perspective. And he said, look, you, you have to lead by intent and they can't divine that intent. You have to explain it. And so you don't <laughs> explain that once, right? You, you get people to understand how you think and how you see and what value you're placing on, on things. And then when they have to change the plan because the change the plant always has to be changed. They understand what the intent of the organization and the senior leaders are. So I think this, this ability to think out loud, to be transparent and share not only what you want to achieve, but why helps the, the organization, especially a networked organization, adapt to the need. Rob, that sounds contrary to leadership styles as as my education as a young person, uh, obviously well before your time, about strong leaders with a strong silent type, not a lot of conversation with the organizational uh, head. So leadership styles are different uh, and they uh, evolve and you're influencing the evolution. You and uh, General McChrystal and Admiral McRaven, General Petraeus, uh, well, let's take General Mattis, for example. Uh, a legend story that I heard about him was uh, he was single Christmas time in the uh, D.C. area. And he was uh, I guess he was a, a two or three star at that time. And he uh, went to a, he had a practice of bringing cookies around to the men who were on guard duty those days, manning uh, entry posts, et cetera. He went and there uh, were two uh, two offices uh, 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 in a uh, 
in an entry gate, gate with a, a a bit of a security house there. And uh, one fellow, he got talking with them and explained, yeah, his family lived nearby, but they understood they wouldn't see him that Christmas. And he said, well, you know what? I'm finished with my rounds of uh, delivering my cookies, as I always do at Christmas. He said, uh, why don't you go have dinner with them and I'll take your shift. And someone arrived at the guardhouse and asked the uh, duty officer who, who was in charge. And he said, well, it's uh, uh, General uh, uh, General uh, Mattis. And he said, no, no, I didn't ask who was in charge of the army. I asked who was in charge uh, of the uh, duty officer today. And he says, no, that would be General Mattis, who then proceeded to come out from the back room and the guy's jaw dropped. Yeah. Now, legend story, but it gives you a sense of the man's values, his priorities, and all the signaling that takes place when you're in a leadership yeah. role. When you encounter young people today on a campus, uh, in a workplace, or in just your average life, and you're you're the dad of three, right? That's right. In their in their thirties, thirties uh, now. 30, 34, 32, and thirty one. What what is your advice when people ask you when they learn that you've had this august career about uh, about serving in the military? My my better half is is also a, a veteran. Uh, ER doc who worked in the Navy, she said it best in that her, her life is vastly better. She's a better person for her service. And I feel the same way that certainly you're, you're going to get great experiences, right? You're going to see the world, get some great education and training. You're going to be a better leader. The number one thing I think service provides, and it doesn't have to be in the military. It, you know, it can be in any service related organization but it helps you understand that you're part of a bigger picture and purpose and and your contributions matter and you need to try to make a difference because you can we both walked away from our careers with with just such great appreciation for what the military helped make of us as individuals and as as people as leaders as as citizens we put our heart into everything we do we are farmers bakers florists and makers who grow and create with a passion made with love at every step of the way because at the end of the day we know you're sending more than a gift 1-800 flowers share with love. I, I don't know if we talked about this, Jim, but I, I'm involved with with an effort to highlight cancer and special operations, and and we think we're seeing significant amounts of cancer rates within the military and within special operations, and and part of that is toxic exposure brought on by our jobs, right? Just so, so let, you did mention that to me, and I, and I've read a little bit about it since we first spoke, Rob, and. And, and share with us about, A, you had a personal incident, and B, what got you interested in, and the, well, some of the things you told me, frankly, rocked me. Yeah. Uh, you told me about uh, the incidents in, in uh, young personnel of cancer and how different it is from the general population. That tells you, without a control group, that there's something interesting going, or something fatal going on here that uh, should be of concern to us all. And then you broke it down by different service services and the incidents, and not surprisingly, but still alarming, is the number of aviators yeah. uh, and, the, and the incidence of cancer among the aviator, aviator community. I was diagnosed at the end of my career with, uh, with prostate cancer. I went in and one of my doctors said, have, you know, you're a young guy. It's very rare to have advanced cancer that's this aggressive because prostate cancer usually is not aggressive. Right. At your age, have do you know if you were exposed to anything? And I said, well, I'm absolutely sure I was exposed. <laughs> I don't know to what, right? I mean, I was around burn pits. I I was in a job that that had high exposure rates, and and you know that includes. You don't think about the ingredients of a bullet, the tox toxicity of a single bullet, and for yeah, most yeah. people and most military guys, they don't shoot a ton of bullets. But a special operator is shooting, a single operator is shooting more bullets than a battalion of Marines. We're doing a lot of that indoors. And so the toxic exposure is significant. And that's just mm -hmm. job related. Then you go overseas 
And, you know, there's toxic exposure there. There's lifestyle exposure. The World Health Organization a few years ago declared that night shifts were a carcinogen. Well, you, all you did was work at night. That's all we did. That's right. There's lifestyle exposures, there's environmental exposures, and there's there's toxic exposures that that build on each other. And part of the lifestyle, we which made me think of this, Jim, is right the the unending grind of of decades of war, guys going on deployment after deployment after deployment creates more inflammation in your body and cancer feeds on inflammation. So yes. this is all a presumption and assumption that these are the causes. What we do know is that we're seeing a great number of young, relatively healthy military members who are diagnosed with literally dozens and dozens of different types of cancer, some very rare, some normal, but rare to occur in a 30-year-old yes. in stage four cancer. So it's just shocking, and and we need to do something, both as as individuals and as as a nation. Please uh, share with us how long you've been cancer free now. It's been just over five years. So I was very mm. lucky. My team of of doctors and care professionals, I think, since who who I was and where we were coming from as a family, and we were super aggressive with surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, hormone therapy. I mean, we threw the kitchen sink at it, been doing very well ever since. And I, I'm very heartened to see genomics and pre precision medicine where you can get a tailored immunotherapy to your cancer and we're seeing breakthrough after breakthrough. So I'm very hopeful that in the coming years, we're going to get even more successful with cancer in the military when when guys and gals have late stage cancer and they have late stage cancer because they're not screened early they're not aware of their exposures and the medical community is definitely young they they don't think they should even possibly be checking that's right and when a guy or gal presents with a medical problem they the first thought of the care provider is oh let me this seems like cancer let me screen it out and so it's missed so many, you know, for for a year, or year year plus, as it's aggressively growing inside of them. I have the privilege here of getting to know and work with, uh, from a fund fundraising point of view, a couple of doctors here at NYU Langone, Doctors Kimmelman and Doctor Haas, who uh, are research scientists and a lead practitioner both around uh, prostate but other cancers, but uh, heavily uh, interested and in working on prostate cancer, and they pound the table over the fact that uh, some great advances are being made, some great treatments have been developed, and that no man really should die from prostate cancer because it's all about early detection and then treatment options are plenty. Uh, but they, they're, it's their life mission to uh, to eradicate this. Uh, but it seems to me that there's a whole world of uh, young people in the service uh, who we have to... Uh, raise the uh, alarm bell around to make, make sure they're being checked because if it's discovered early it's quite treatable but right. if it's not checked if it's not discovered uh then then it can become a real problem and you do have to throw the kitchen sink out of it and not everybody is as lucky as you are to have been able to uh rid yourself of it that that's right and now, I, now tell I, me I, uh, under what auspices are you doing this work now is it just your personal interest are you aligned with other uh, institutions to uh, look at this issue, bring it to public attention and to the attention of the right authorities that, that that we have this special issue going on here with the frequency of cancer among uh, service members? Yeah, there, there are several aspects of this. When when I worked for Admiral McRaven and I ran his joint interagency task force for counterterrorism, we were looking at how we get after terrorist organizations outside of combat zones, right? You're not going to go do a direct action mission in in Paris, France or or Belgium. And these networks, these terrorist networks, logistics and finance spread throughout the world. The the strategy we we developed, I called swarming. And it was it was based on John Arquilla and David Ronfeldt's research on on swarming as a warfare method. And and the the deal on swarming is it's a lot of small elements who come from every direction and overwhelm a larger 
entity. And so yeah. what we did is we designed swarms and, and we picked one guy who may or may not have been important, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but he had a global network. And so we said, all right, let's let's deconstruct this global network by every agency in the government doing something against this guy's network. And that became our the national strategy on how the interagency worked against counterterrorism. And so as I was looking at cancer, one, I, I realized that that the government is never going to be responsive enough. If you look at the history of toxic exposure in warfare, including Vietnam and Agent Orange and the desert, the Gulf War syndrome and sarin gas exposure to the 9-11 World Trade Center exposure, you usually see years of delay before legislation and policy start to be established, and then more years before they come upon a comprehensive effort that's, that is, is very helpful. You also see years and years of delays in, in research. Just this year, a DNA study found that it was sarin gas exposure that, causes, that caused the Gulf War syndrome. That was three I didn't realize that. decades ago. And, and part of the problem is, you know, institutions are based on, on evidence-based response. And yep. so if you don't have the evidence, there's always going to be some bureaucrat who, who not inappropriately says, hey, we have a lot of things to do, and there's no evidence on this. My feeling was, look, it's going to take years before the government response in an appropriate way. The PACT Act is a very first small step in kind of addressing toxic exposure. It's not enough. And there, there's more that needs to be done. It's going to take years to make that happen. In the interim, I think we need what I call a social swarm. And that's multiple organi organizations coming from their own charter, their own purpose. They're not sacrificing right what they were built to do but they are doing what they can and they're coordinating everything they're doing so you can see where the gaps and holes are. So I've been coordinating with, with more than 40 special operations nonprofits, veteran support organizations who, who support different tribes and clans of the special operations community to try to increase communication, to try to increase awareness. And I've also reached out to to wonderful nonprofits that are beyond special operations. Two of the best are Hunter 7. Hunter 7 is a phenomenal nonprofit that does cancer research around the military, and they also support military members with second opinions and insight, and, and they do some kind of nurse case management. The other organization I discovered is here in San Diego called Soteria Precision Medicine Institute. And Soteria does so many things very well. They, they are leading the effort on, on genomics and precision medicine for, for people getting hooked up to clinical trials of their specific cancer with immunotherapy and precision medicine. But they also do amazing case management. As a cancer right survivor, one of the biggest things a person faces with cancer is first their, their own mortality and then thrown into the deep end of a medical community who you don't speak their language, you don't understand their culture, they're moving a mile a minute and you go into your clinical meetings and you're just dumbfounded. And then you walk away and days later, you're like, oh, I wish I would have asked about this. I wish I would have, we would have talked about that. And so what Soteria does is, is they, they prepare their partners, the people that they support before a meeting. Yep. Look, we're going to talk about this. You should ask about this. Let's practice this. I, I haven't found anybody that, that does it as well. So again, I, I'm trying to do some fundraising for Hunter 7 and, and Soteria. I'm trying to rally these 40 plus nonprofits to work together and to move beyond individualized care. When, when I looked at there's some great organizations. If you're a military guy or special operations guy, you say, I have cancer. They're more than, than willing and they, they lean forward to, to help, right? With your travel, with incidentals, with lining you up with a second opinion. 
but it's an individual one-off, one-by-one effort. So as a result, we're not learning as a community. We're not learning yep. as a nation. And I, I I felt like it was, you know, your question about- It's one at a time over and over and over yeah. again without the system learning exactly. uh, about getting smarter and, and, and changing the processes to be yeah. better at treatment. Right. And I related that to your question about, well, were we really at war for 20 years? No, in Afghanistan, we were at war one year at a time. We had one year yes. lessons. People left and they relearn the same lessons. And so now we're seeing it in cancer. So I'm trying to develop this swarm. There's another great organization, the Military Special Operations Family Collaborative. And they're a policy-oriented organization that supports special operations community. They've asked me to chair their cancer task force, which we're just standing up. And so I'm I'm doing, you know, I'm doing all of this kind of under the umbrella of the Military Special Operations Family Collaborative. Rob, let me ask you some uh, a couple of questions as we get to the end of our time here. There's a war going on now in Western Europe, in Europe, which is uh, uh, Eastern Europe, which is uh, hard for me to imagine. I'm saying that out loud that it's that it's true. Leadership and culture. Uh, a word or two about what we think we've learned about Russian leadership and culture, and you've already commented, but a little more on on President Zelensky and and the Ukrainian leadership and its culture? Well, I think you can see that the, you know, the Russian leadership and culture is is divorced from their their operating arms. They have no idea how poorly equipped and ready their forces were, and they really don't consider their well-being in any decision they've made to take draftees and send them directly into the conflict with no preparation. It's it's clear that, you know, the morale and the will to fight just doesn't exist in an organization when you have that type of leadership. And then you compare that to Zelensky and, and the Ukrainian military leaders who are in it with their troops and they're they're not wasting their lives needlessly. They have well-developed plans for for succeeding on the battlefield, and certainly the United States and NATO and other contributing partners have have helped on the material side and and on the intelligence side and on the planning side. But it's it's the Ukrainians and and their leadership and their culture that are really making making the difference. How does it end? I, I think it ends when when senior Russian leadership realizes that that there's there's no good there's no good to come out of it and and potentially you know i think i think eventually putin dies of of either a natural or unnatural illness and they make changes from there the other thing i wonder about is i follow uh, professor uh, jeffrey sonnenfeld up at yale and his uh, research assistant stephen tian and they've been uh, they've been chronicling and documenting what Western businesses have done vis-a-vis the sanctions in terms of pulling out of Russia. Uh, I wonder if an economic collapse isn't imminent, uh, because I read their work, I read their research, and they're talking about how the ruble really isn't a real currency anymore, uh, that uh, that the sanctions are having very, very big impacts. And I just wonder if uh, we found out that culture does matter, especially in military uh, situations. And we're seeing the impact of a poor culture in their military's performance. And I wonder if that doesn't, if it's not separate, but quite related to its economic circumstance. And might we see an economic collapse first? That's, yeah, that's far beyond my expertise. But I, you know, I think back to our senior military leaders who who talked about the United States economy being the number one asset. And and so you can't sacrifice your economy for other national security objectives because that's the engine. And, yes. and so certainly, I think there's that piece of it. And then the other question as the economy starts to buckle is what what is the, the Russian population? How much will they endure before they say enough? Rob, uh, you're nothing short of uh, fascinating, uh, interesting, inspiring a genuine American hero, and I don't say that lightly. One of the confessions I'd have for you is, as an employer, uh, when we're lucky enough to come across someone who has a uh, 
military background, let alone a, a special operator's background, were always wondering, could anything we'd ask them to do here ever live up to the challenge, the excitement, the energy uh, that they've experienced in their military careers? So we're always, as employers, and I've had this conversation with others who are in my situation, we're always wondering, can we can we get do things that are interesting enough for them? And what would you tell us? Well, I think that certainly, right, there's nothing that compares to the camaraderie, the mission, the purpose of serving the nation in, in uniform. When that is over and service members move on to their next great adventure, it doesn't mean that everything has to pale in comparison or that the food, the wine, the, the joy is not there in, in everything you do. What I found in in my my short four years out of out of the Navy and looking forward to new opportunities is what inspires me and I think what inspires military people is the ability to contribute to something that matters and it doesn't have to be national defense it has, doesn't have to be life and death but but help us understand why it why it matters and allow us to find our contribution points. I, I think I've been reading a lot about idiosyncratic jobs and, and create job creating and, and molding jobs to the person. I, I, I certainly think I, I bring something unique, and, but I'm not plug and play. Oh, let's put Rob in the vice president of X job, right? And so- Procurement. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So I, I think there's there's unique people that that you should find a way to shape and frame jobs that may not even exist, but you you can be certain they're going to be value added to an organization. And um, again, it's about giving people an opportunity to contribute, to shape and impact the lives of others, and and that matters, right? So mm -hmm. I, I look at. Can I help an organization succeed? Can I help other leaders lead better? And so, so there's two things you just said in there that jump out at me. One is you want to be part of something. Yeah. You want to understand and embrace the mission is the second. And then the last thing that comes to mind there is you, you want to play a leadership role. You want to bring your skills, your experiences about leadership to help any organization in its mission. I, I, I could talk to you forever. I'm a fan. Uh, I'm a student of, of what you're doing and look forward to getting to know you better, Rob. I, I think your future is mighty bright. And I look forward to catching up with you again on the, your next adventure and, uh, and for all of us to help support you in your efforts in your part-time gig of helping to find out why these incidents of cancer in and uh, military personnel are so much higher than the, the general population. Seeing what we can do about it, number one, and number two, making sure care, treatment, and research happens to help those who've already been exposed and therefore are suffering or about to suffer. So I, I commend you for your work. Thank you for your service to our country. Sometimes it feels contrite to say that, but I've never felt it more appropriate than to say it to you. Good luck in your work on, on your cancer research, and I can't wait to see what your next personal career step is going to be, because you're going to make one heck of a difference. Thanks, Jim. It's been great talking to you, and I, I appreciate it. It's been my honor to serve, and and I hope to continue to do that in, in new and different oh, ways. This is birthday. Go to 100flowers.com. They have tons of great birthday gifts. Wow. 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 Happy birthday, baby. Happy birthday. Ow. Yummy. I got to contain myself. 1 800 Flowers. Celebrate the people you love. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800 Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Celebrations Chatter. You can join our community by reaching out at chatter at celebrations.com. And while you're at it, tell us what topics you'd like us to explore here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to share it forward. <laughs>